All right, hi everybody. Um, welcome again, all delegates. Uh, my name is Tim Van Erik. I'm uh, the leading up the product uh, management team at uh, VeloCloud. Uh, BU, uh, and I got in the room, and the back of the room, uh, Fan Gu, um, Tony Banuelos, and Jaspreet Batia, they're gonna chime in uh, during the presentation as well today. So very excited to uh, provide you with an SD1 product update uh, today. Uh, but before we do that, I um, want to do a quick uh, recap of like uh, our engagements with the uh, Network Field Day team uh, before. So this is our fourth uh, installation uh, um, that we presented at the Network Field Day. So many moons ago in 2015, uh, we started uh, introducing this concept of software-defined networking uh, to the world. Uh, in the meantime, it's taken a life of its own. It's established a very broad industry today. 2016, we gave you a quick update on what the footprint of the service looks like, and then also give you a little bit of insight in how we deploy these like large-scale enterprise networks, as well as how we architect uh, um, service provider integrations. And then last year, uh, this was the first time after the acquisition uh, into VMware, uh, we provo uh, provided an update on some of the more advanced features, uh, like a Palo Alto VNF integration on the edges, or even uh, outcome-driven networking, as well as segmentation. So we're going to continue that cadence uh, today, uh, and we're going to provide you with um, a couple of uh, update items. So we're going to first give an update on some of the analytics capabilities in the solution that we're developing, uh, talk a little bit about the security ecosystem that we're expanding today, and then we're going to wrap up with some of the cloud integrations that we're pursuing as well. Uh, but I do believe that uh, we do have some new uh, delegates in the room that haven't been introduced to the solution yet. So before we go into some of the specifics, I want to do a five-minute recap of like why it is that uh, enterprises are gravitating uh, towards deploying as the one solution and what sort of like the primary driver is and like what the solution actually looks like. So if we look at uh, the primary drivers, you can uh, condense it or distill it down into four major categories. So one of the more important one is the ability for uh, branches uh, to consume applications in a very reliable and performant way, regardless on where these applications are. So that's a primary driver today. It's often in inhibited by the fact that there is very low bandwidth MPLS at those branches and it makes it difficult to reach um, cloud-based applications in that case. Other important factor that we do see is that there is a lot of agility required in the networks today, so there's a lot of changes that you will need to enact on a regular basis, but you also want to do very rapid rollouts of branches. So this is specifically interesting to the retail environment. Think about a pop-up store. If you need to roll that out, you can't really wait uh, three months for an MPLS circuit uh, to come online. You want that store to come online in a matter of days. Uh, other um, major important item uh, for the financial officers is the financial performance of the branches. Uh, we often see that if you do uh, deploy MPLS circuits at those branches, that uh, the MPLS uh, cap uh, capacity for those branches is uh, one of the top uh, line items in the budget for those uh, branches. So we're looking for alternative ways and uh, in more uh, inexpensive ways to connect bandwidth uh, to those locations while still preserving uh, the performance and reliability of those links. And then last but not least, uh, we also want to make sure that we do a simplified security approach. So it's uh, very often uh, an approach where you deploy an appliance uh, in the branches. So we want to make sure that we can actually do that from a single pane of glass, make sure that we uh, con uh, condense all of the uh, management of those appliances uh, in a single place. Uh, and if we look at the uh, analyst community, so um, they've uh, looked at uh, some of the SD1 solution in place, uh, and they've uh, looked at what sort of like the key capabilities are that you need in an SD1 solution, and they come up with four uh, major uh, technologies. Uh, so the first one uh, is to be transport independent. So it's the ability to consume any bandwidth that you have available at a site location. So whether that is wired or wireless bandwidth, whether that is private or uh, public capacity internet links versus MPLS links. So any of those capacities you should be able to use. And then the next step is to build an overlay of those uh, uh, transport links so that we abstract that physical capacity and drive an overlay that we provide connectivity to all of the destinations that the applications need to use. And we're also gonna categorize those uh, or the quality of uh, those bandwidth. So that leads us to the next uh, capability is the dynamic path selection. So now that you know how an application uh, is on the network, like where it needs to go, uh, you know sort of like how these applications uh, or like well, how the paths are performing on the network, you can make intelligent decisions on how to steer uh, the applications to the best available link. Uh, and the last item is a uh, simple interface. Uh, sounds uh, pretty straightforward, but it's not just limited to an administrator interface. So not just limited to a portal that you can use that is intuitive, uh, but it also extends out to a simple interface for the DevOps community so that there are REST APIs available, SDKs available, so that you can directly integrate uh, some of the capabilities of the orchestrator into existing and third-party systems. 
Uh, and then last but not least, there is also a requirement for having a simple interface for uh, deploying the branch uh, devices. Uh, so if you do want to work with uh, a technician on site that installs the device or even a store clerk, uh, you don't need a CCIE again to deploy these devices. It should be very uh, instructional, very simple to deploy these physical units. So let's uh, look at some of the architecture that is in place. So first off, like we have, uh, the solution is basically comprised out of three components. Uh, the most visible one is the uh, SD1 Edge device that you see all the way on the left-hand side over here. Uh, the Edge device is effectively deployed at the branch location. It's responsible for connecting to all of the physical uh, uh, transport links. So that uh, device is going to make independent decisions and it gets all of its policy and intelligence from the orchestrator, which you see on the top here. And the orchestrator is the central place where you deploy the policies and you uh, uh, monitor the solution as a whole as well. So it is also the REST uh, uh, API endpoint, uh, and even if you consume the portal, that is all built on top of an existing REST API. So if you're a portal user, you're actually an API user at that time as well. Uh, and then last, uh, we do have our uh, gateways that uh, you see in the middle, and the gateways are effectively a multi-tenant equivalent of the Edge uh, device in place. Uh, they provide off-ramp <laughs> capabilities towards uh, cloud services, so they are uh, strategically located in a lot of uh, um, uh, locations that are close to uh, cloud services, and we typically see them somewhere in the proximity of less than five milliseconds today. So they also uh, facilitate uh, VPN connections in between the dual branches, so uh, think of like very large-scale uh, VPN designs, uh, so as you probably know, that you uh, very quickly run into scalability issues, uh, both from a tunnel perspective as well as from uh, a routing protocol perspective. So the gateways actually provide a waypoint uh, in, uh, to connect to other branches uh, in the network, uh, and now the edge uh, or the edges uh, that are deployed at the branches only need to form like a limited series of tunnels to a series of gateways, and that will provide interconnectivity to the rest of the network. So it makes it highly scalable even for very large uh, deployments. Uh, and the gateways are also responsible for connecting to uh, existing legacy data centers. So if you have a data center uh, with just a, a VPN router, then we can build a standard-based IP tunnel from the gateways to that data center and provide connectivity to there. I want to dive a little bit uh, deeper into uh, one of our key differentiating technologies, which is our dynamic multipath optimization. Uh, it's effectively an umbrella technology. Uh, it's comprised out of a couple of different uh, components. Uh, the first one is our deep application recognition engine. So this is going to identify which applications are on the network. And in the background, we have a database that actually understands like, what the networking requirements are for each of those applications. Next step is to actually build a secure overlay. So I mentioned um, we're looking at transport independency. So the overlay is going to abstract the underlying transport. So whether it's private or public capacity, the overlay will abstract that. Uh, and then more importantly, uh, we're going to measure uh, how the underlays are actually behaving uh, in a real-time fashion so that we extract the amount of bandwidth that is available in each of those parts. We'll find out what uh, uh, packet loss, jitter, and latency uh, characteristics are available. And then, of course, with that information, so now we know which applications are on the network, what they need from the network, all of the different paths to get to the destination of the application, and we know how the paths are behaving at this point. So the next thing, a logical uh, step, is that we can make intelligent decisions on how to steer these applications. Uh, and we do that on a per-packet basis so that we can react in a sub-second fashion uh, to degradations in the underlying transport. So if there is packet loss on a voice stream, we can move the very next packet over uh, to a better performing link. If we can't find a better performing link, then we have remediation capabilities that we dynamically enabled uh, once we see that occur. Uh, and we can enable forward error correction techniques, uh, de-jitter buffering techniques uh, to mitigate the effects out of packet loss and jitter uh, out of the equation. So the net result is that we're now able to deliver these applications in a very reliable fashion, even though the underlying transport is uh, highly variable. Question. Uh, sure. The, the gateways that you mentioned, are they mandatory or are they optional? Uh, they are optional, so we have a couple of different uh, offerings. Uh, one offering is uh, without uh, the use of a gateway, then we uh, inject a controller in the system. And the controller is effectively going to facilitate uh, measurements of the underlay, uh, and it's also going to participate in routing. So it's effectively a routing proxy. Uh, the gateways itself, like if you upgrade to the full gateway capacity, then they're going to be a waypoint to carry the traffic to its final destination. So they provide you on-ramp capabilities into cloud applications, and they can protect the traffic while you get to business-critical uh, cloud applications. 
So how does this uh, work? Um, so if we look at uh, some of the effects, so this is a screenshot from one of our orchestrators. You see on the top uh, all of the links that are being connected uh, to an edge location, and uh, you will see in real time, we're going to measure how much bandwidth is available on all of those spots. We're going to figure out how much latency, jitter, and packet loss. And then on the bottom, we're going to do an artificial scoring of how these links are behaving uh, if we're carrying voice traffic in this case. Uh, and you see that uh, the LTE uh, link that is uh, connected to, or the yeah, the LTE link uh, that is connected over here uh, is highly variable. There's a lot of uh, jitter uh, on that uh, particular link. The top link as well, uh, you see that there's a lot of impairments happening, but because we can do these steering decisions, we can make sure that the voice trans, uh, the transport over those links, over the overlay is actually secured and performing, and it's not uh, uh, exhibiting a lot of the packet loss uh, that is on the underlay uh, links uh, available. Uh, so even though uh, both of the links may have impairments, we can still do forward error correction, so giving a clean bill of health to the network in order to deliver those applications. And we talked uh, a little bit about the edges before in the architecture, so I want to invite uh, Tony Banuelas over. He's going to uh, give us a quick update on like, how the uh, edge appliance portfolio looks like and how we are evolving that uh, appliance, and then he's going to talk a little bit more about the analytics capabilities uh, that we're onboarding. Thanks, Tim. Okay. Hi guys, uh, I'm Tony Banuelos. I'm a product manager within the Velo Cloud BU here at VMware. Uh, <clears throat> and so what I'll start off is this is our current hardware portfolio. So the important part here is uh, VMware is going to keep offering the Velo Cloud, or in this case, the VMware SD-WAN platforms. Uh, but we also do have the software-only version. Uh, this will keep it simple for customers to consume our services. Uh, they don't have to go and find a platform if they, if they don't want to. We'll, we'll offer that. And we'll offer them, um, to make it simple, in a subscription fashion or a capex. So we have customers that are looking <laughs> to just lease the equipment. They don't want to own it. They want to lease it for three, five years. We turn it back, move to the, to the next gen if we have it. Um, or there's the customers that want to go uh, full software, so we do have our virtual edges uh, available as well. So that's just an OVA uh, that you would deploy on an ESXi, or we also have a, a KVM form factor. Um, the range of platforms are going to take you from 200 meg all the way to 10 gig, uh, depending on the size of the site, site of the branch. Uh, your aggregation point, your private data center is going to be taking the high end. Uh, max is 10 gig. If you need to go higher than 10 gig, we have clustering uh, capabilities. You can cluster these edges and get you know, to your 40, 40 gig, 100 gig uh, capacity uh, using our cluster uh, design. Is there any uh, top end for the number of Devices you eight. put into a cluster? Eight. Uh, so, so your theoretical max is 80 gig? Yeah. Okay. And it scales linearly? Yes. So the new piece is um, our Edge 510 LTE. So this is something that's coming here at the end of uh, March. Yeah, if we could pass that on. Um, this is the, the same device as our, our 510 without the, with, without the wireless. But as you saw in... Um, uh, Tim's uh, graph, uh, we do support LTE via USB modems. A lot of customers use a handoff from like a cradle point uh, router and hand it off Ethernet to the, to the, to the edge. Uh, but there's been a lot of requests to have uh, integrated LTE. There's a lot of use cases that make it very easy. Uh, think about uh, a company that's doing uh, construction. So you, you bring up a construction site. Uh, you don't want to have to order a broadband. You don't want to have to order, uh, you know, MPLS into that site. Uh, you put one of these in your, in your construction kit, you, it comes up, it has uh, options, it's, it is multi-carrier, so you can stick in a, an AT&T SIM, a Verizon SIM, T-Mobile SIM, it'll come up. We're working uh, with uh, at and is already certified today, Verizon is in progress, uh, T-Mobile is in progress, we'll have those uh, enabled by, by GA, which is again, as I mentioned, March. Um, it's an uh, aggregate throughput 200 meg uh, on the box. Uh, it has uh, two uh, SIM cards. Uh, they're uh, active standby. When we GA, uh, it'll be a single, single SIM. Uh, in a later phase, we'll enable it so that we can have an active standby, so you'll be able to have an AT&T SIM, a Verizon SIM, and they'll, uh, they'll uh, act as an active standby. We also have a built-in GPS uh, for future use. Uh, it's not going to be enabled uh, by GA, but uh, we are already talking to customers uh, especially in the finance where they want to mount these guys on ATM, if that ATM 
goes away, gets carried away. They can actually use the GPS to track it. Again, it's not, it's not in the GA, but that's a, a use case that we're looking to uh, enable in the future. Can you swap between the wireless carriers? You will be able to. Again, it'll, it'll, it'll always be active standby. We won't, it won't be active active. Uh, there are, use, there are uh, customers that have, that have requested active active. So you can always still use it, the, our USB ports. It'll, it'll keep the same uh, number of USB ports, and you'll be able to uh, connect a, a USB-based uh, uh, okay. modem on there as well, and then have it active active. Is there like is the the reason why it's not active active because of a limitation? Like there were, there was you know some challenges, or was it just because there were you know like it's just not demand? Like why why not allow an active the, active? The demand for active active hasn't been there much for us. It's, you know, it's, it's either broadband with an LTE or broadband LTE MPLS. Right. Having two active active um, it wasn't just a, a, a high use, a high demand for us. And so okay. cost wise, it was better just to keep it this way. I could just see from a, from a, you know, a mobile application perspective, you know what I'm saying? We want a branch, but we want the branch to be 100% mobile. Okay. Having two potential paths and depending on how the carrier is performing at that time, being able to yeah. route accordingly, and, would, yeah. seems like a pretty natural use case. It, it, it is. Again, the demand hasn't been there. So, sure. we, yeah, we'll, we'll wait. So and, and, and just maybe to uh, add on to that, uh, you can always complement this with uh, USB uh, modems as well. And sure. those can still be active. We can make it happen, but just <laughs> yeah. not natively within the box. Right. So, uh, out of curiosity, because you mentioned T Mobile for LTE coverage, I mean, they're V6 only. Sorry. Right? They're V6 only on T Mobile. So what are you guys doing in terms of backup for like you got V6 endpoints? So there, so we, so the, so the, right, so the, so the modem will do the, uh, will do the V, the V6, uh, but we'll, uh, it'll, it'll do the IPv6 to V, to V4 on, on our into our code. Uh, so they provide NAT64, DNS64 on the internal side for them. Are you guys doing 646x lab? What do you have inside the box that's actually providing V4 instance? Because if your head end is only talking V4, you're yes. on T-Mobile with V6 only. Who's doing the? Yeah, so at, at this point, all of the modems that we're working with are still V4 capable modems. And then V6 is uh, an item that we have on our roadmap uh, to cover as well. On T Mobile, it's V6 only on their LTE side. Yes. Uh, you, you talk to Cameron, I mean. Like... The modems uh, that we're using, we're using uh, vendor agnostic modems at this point, uh, and they're still V4 uh, capable. So. They're V4 capable, are they doing with 646 XLAT, or do you know what they're. Uh, that's something that we can no, maybe have, discuss offline. Right, we no, can to, get the I've, details. I, I know I have, I have one uh, connected to T-Mobile. I'll have to find the, the details of how we yeah, I, I'm interested how you guys are tunneling from a 646 x slot okay. configuration from V4 to V4 across a V6 backbone. Okay. That's only providing okay. you V6 we'll, connectivity. Yeah, we'll get those so. details. Yeah. Okay, so now I'm going to move uh, back, to, back to the software, back to our solution from a Velo Cloud. Um, you know, we provide SD-WAN, we provide the value of being able to optimize across any type of transport, uh, guaranteeing SLAs across uh, different types of applications. So you can actually use this as a, as a platform, right? So and one of the other things that you can do and that we simplify is the service insertion of security uh, services. And so Fan and Leader Slides is going to cover that. Uh, but we have an ecosystem of partners that we use today that you can simply, uh, you know, the customer is able to choose from and service insert uh, to protect uh, their, their applications flowing out to the, out to the internet. Um, we're also uh, going to cover our partnerships with uh, cloud uh, partners and how we integrate easily so, so that you can spin up uh, Velo Cloud services within those cloud uh, partners uh, with a click of a button. Uh, and then we're going to touch upon uh, our analytics uh, partners as well and what we're doing with them so that they can actually take in information from us and provide a visibility of how the network is performing. So really quick on the analytics, uh, from a third party perspective, this is a, a, a device that's taking, ingesting our uh, metrics and showing value or uh, network monitoring capabilities. So we're uh, developing a couple of new things Here's uh, Syslog, uh, SNMP, and NetFlow. Uh, so these are, are three pieces that we're missing that enterprises have been asking for. Um, basically, to be able to export this information into a central collector that they use today so that they can provide, uh, so that they can see how the network is behaving. Uh, the REST API on our Velo Cloud Orchestrator is still there. 
Uh, it's still the richest information that you can obtain, uh, but we recognize that not uh, many enterprises have the, the expertise to, to, you know, to write up a, a, a REST API call engine to, to pull out you know, link metrics and flow data and, and all this other stuff. So, we, so, we're, so we're giving uh, our customers SNMP, Syslog, NetFlow, very common tools that they use today so that they can plug into the existing tools that they use uh, in, their, in their data centers. So from a NetFlow perspective, um, we're moving. So we do have NetFlow today. Um, it's not very rich in the information that it shares today. So we're developing uh, or enhancing our NetFlow capabilities. We're moving to an IP fix template uh, version, version 10. Uh, it's going to have uh, basic flow key so that any vendor, any NetFlow vendor can actually start collecting this information, start sh uh, you know, showing stats on our network. So, uh, but we're also going to uh, develop enterprise information elements. So these, these uh, key uh, data is going to allow for a customer or a flow collector to determine uh, things like application recognition. Right? So we're going to add uh, the intelligence of our app into the flow. So the flows that they collect, it will also have an application ID. Uh, the regular data stream statistics, statistics uh, data volume, how many bytes, packets received, sent, uh, the amount of data through the whole life of that flow. Uh, we're going to also provide net network path ID. So uh, where is this flow going? Is it going uh, to the application? Is, the, is it going through my gateway in the cloud? Is it going to my hub in the data center? Is it going back to, to an edge in the case that it's going edge to edge? Right? So they'll be able to identify the path there. And then the value is in our SD-WAN remediation events, so a customer uh, you know, from a knock, being able to monitor not only uh, the SD1 network, right, but they might have multi-vendor uh, systems within the data center, WAN, uh, wireless. So they'll have uh, something like uh, a network monitoring tool from either you know we're partnering with vRealize VMware or oh, that's our offering. We're partnering with Plexer, Set One, Solar Winds. Uh, these remediation events will, uh, will tell an admin that there's something going on with the underlay. Our protocol, our DMPO protocol is now doing you know, excessive forward error correction or excessive uh, link steering or excessive uh, jitter buffering. And that will alert, that will uh, could alert an admin to go and look at our element manager, our VCO, to then understand better what's going on with the underlay connection. Any questions? Do you, uh, other than NetFlow, do you do any kind of underlay monitoring? Like if your overlay is changing or failing back to another circuit, mm -hmm. do you know why or, or anything like that? So there's, uh, there's another piece to that uh, that we're doing on the VCO, so I'll, I'll let uh, Van cover that. But for not, for, from the NetFlow perspective, this is what we're uh, exporting by end of March. Um, there'll be other enhancements, but that's, those are still to be defined. So I'm going to run you guys quickly uh, through a demo. Uh, this is uh, Plexer Scrutinizer. Uh, they have some code from us. Uh, they were able to simulate a network within their environment and started to uh, push uh, or show uh, the stats based on our NetFlow, uh, NetFlow uh, data. And if I can figure out where my mouse went. There we go. <laughs> okay. So typical uh, type of information, right? So what they're showing here is uh, a, a view of all devices and their and, and the type of applications that they're pushing across their network. Um, these are these are remediation events that they exaggerated, but we wanted to show it on the on the screen. But you'll they'll also have information around. Jitter, loss, latency. Again, this is uh, information that's related to the overlay, but it's, it really does represent what's happening in the underlay. It's, a, it's an artificial reading of the underlay. Um, you'll be able to have the, same, the metrics that I spoke of, uh, amount of data, uh, how much has been pushed and, uh, through this, through this uh, uh, related to this application. And then you'll have the ability also to then drill down and look at, uh, find uh, through this uh, tool, 
the, a certain site, right? And start drilling down into the interfaces of that site so that you can start looking at uh, you know, the interfaces, uh, the type of provider that that link is tied to. So in this case, a Sprint, a sprint, broad, a sprint Broadband. Uh, it'll also be able to see what type of right, uh, route type. So it's going back home means it's going back to a, a hub, uh, to a private data center. Uh, and again, the same type of metrics and also have uh, the remediation events that are happening on the, on the overlay. Um, and then further from there, you'll be able to filter. Uh, pick a, a, a site, uh, exporter means an edge, uh, put it into a site and then drill down even further uh, to look at the applications uh, that are flowing through that site and then tie that to an interface and be able to see uh, exactly what's going on on that site. So we have a list of applications, uh, the data uh, related to each application and then be able to sort on uh, you know, top application uh, so you can see what application is consuming the most bandwidth and um, how, it's, how it's performing related to remediation events. So that's the last screen. And so that's, that's basically the, uh, the demo. Um, do you guys have any, any other questions? That's Plixer working off NetFlow data that you've exported. That, that, we, that, that they're taking from our exporters, yes, correct. <clears throat> and things like interface, I wouldn't normally be able to get from the VeloCloud controller? You can. So, th so think of this uh, as uh, a tool that you're using to monitor not just the SD-WAN piece, but uh, uh, other elements within your network, right? Okay. So it gives you the ability to drill down further here if you wanted to. Uh, you could always say, okay, my remediation events are way too high. I'm just going to go straight to my element manager, which is the VCO, and then drill down there.